you know, in the back of my mind thinking, Hey, have I really accomplished everything I wanted to in short course yards? Maybe not. So, you know, I'm not saying no, I'm not saying yes. I'm just keeping all my doors open at this moment and, uh, you know, figuring out what would be best for me. Yeah, man. Thanks for coming on. Welcome to social kick. We got the full crew, Dr. John Mullen, Luke Paddington, and the man Olympic bronze medalist, Casper Corvo. What's going on, buddy? How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me. Um, looking forward to breaking some things down and just having a good time. Yeah, totally. You're very aesthetically pleasing right now too. All white, white, <laughs> white sweatshirt, white cabinets, white face. What's going on? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I guess I guess it's just uh, it's the modern Amsterdam vibe. I guess you know, man, it's just yeah, uh, it's very Dutch. Brian's gonna be asking for yeah. your digits here pretty soon. <laughs> well, I yeah, yeah. white hat because I knew I was gonna be uh, in the in the presence of some. I don't know where I'm going with that. I'll just stop. So, <laughs> well, yeah, man, Cancel B. Uh, what do you think is the biggest uh, change that you've seen in uh, you know yourself and your preferences uh, assimilating into European and Dutch culture? Oh man, I mean, there's so many differences. Um, again, from you know the people people that you see every day, um, the way you get around the city, obviously how the city looks, you know. Um, Europe is a lot older, so there's a lot different architecture and everything. The food's a bit different. You know, there's a million things like lists, the training and how everything, how my day to day went by was a lot different than at Texas. Um, and it's, everything has kind of shifted and I've had to adapt and change over time. It's not always easy to make those adjustments, but I think throughout the course of last year, my coach and my friends and also my family helped me make those day-to-day -day changes that could ultimately get me to where I am now. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. Uh, well, speaking of your family, uh, your dad submitted a question uh, when we pulled our audience oh, great. on Instagram at <laughs> Social Kick Swim, and he wants to know what it was like growing up in the slums of Cedar Mill. <laughs> the slums of Cedar Mill. Well, first yeah. of all, not really slums. Um, <laughs> It, it's a nice, decent area. Um, I mean, I I definitely still think, feel that Cedar Mill and it's it's a Portland address, but that it's a a home, a home to me. I have a lot of friends back there, and um, you know the weather for one. It's a lot like Amsterdam. I think it's the same latitudes, uh, so uh, I get the rain and the cold nine months out of the year. So it's just like home here. Yeah. Well, uh, can you explain this for a second? Um, for, for anyone who doesn't know your background, uh, you know, you, you read a bio on you, it sure sounds like you're pretty, pretty dang American, but you've been representing the Netherlands for, for a yeah. long time. Mm -hmm. I understand you're a dual citizen. So, um, can you just explain like where, where that came from the dual citizenship and, and, uh, representing the Netherlands, but like, uh, where you grew up and where you're from? Yeah, I mean, um, I grew up uh, in the, the Bay Area for six years in Santa Cruz. Um, my mom and dad both wanted me to be water safe, grew up there, started swimming a little bit. Um, once I was about six years old, we moved to uh, Forest Grove, Oregon, or Eugene, and then bounced around Forest Grove. And that's when I started my competitive swimming at about eight or nine years old. Um and, you know, continued there for a few more years at Forest Grove Swim Club in Forest Grove, Oregon. And around 12 years old, mom and dad said, all right, I want to get you to a, a bigger city. Um, we're done with the slower life, kind of the countryside, getting you in a bigger city, you know, a bigger public school, everything, maybe even a better club. And um, from there, it kind of just, you know, accelerated. Um, I started to have a bit more success in the age group level. Um and I remember vividly um, when I was 16 years old, um, my dad yelled at me and said, hey, get down to the office. And I was like, oh, crap, I think I'm in trouble. But it was um, <laughs> it was all positive. And he said, hey, what would you think about uh, swimming for the Netherlands? And I said, uh, I don't know. I have to think about it. I think it'd be pretty cool. So at that point, I still had or I had both passports, an American passport and a Dutch passport. Um, and he said, you know, think about it. And we can decide because you'll be going to, you say yes, the European Youth Olympic Festival. And that year was in Gior, Hungary. And that would have been my first and was uh, my first uh, junior international competition for the Netherlands. What sparked that conversation? Did he get an email from the Netherlands or something saying, hey, like you've got a talented kid and scouting you? 
Um, I don't know if there was so much scouting as it was, you know, um, my dad, my mom, my brother, my sister, um, we all really wanted to be a, a well-rounded family, you know, and they have throughout the course of their athletic careers or um, personal life growing up and becoming adults, et cetera, have lived throughout Europe and across the world. Uh, and they thought it was very beneficial for growth and helped them, uh, you know, kind of mold into per the people they are today. Um, so I don't know if it was necessarily scouting, but at that point when I was 16, I don't think I was good enough to make the USA junior team yet, but good enough to make the the Dutch junior team. And yet, again, it was an opportunity. So, you know, why, why pass that up to, you know, further my athletic career at a younger age? Casper, what was that like? Because, you know, I think of Nick Albiero going to swim for Brazil and having to learn Portuguese um, and, you know, a completely different culture down there from Louisville. Or, you know, a lot of people mm -hmm. from, say, Trinidad go to play soccer for England or vice versa. What was that like as a 16-year-old having... Were you raised orange and, uh, you know, American? Did you... Was it easy to go across and learn Dutch and realize everybody is six foot seven, not just me? What was that like to go there? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it was a challenge, of course. Um, I grew up, um, in a household only speaking English. There was no Dutch being spoken at all. Um, mainly for, you know, complex reasons. And how was, how was my dad supposed to know that I'd end up in Europe swimming for the Netherlands in the first place? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, it was a challenge. Um, when I was 16, um, my first junior level, I hadn't really, uh, I didn't really know any touch at all. Just, you know, I say, Oh, thank you. Please. <laughs> I, all the, all the good basic stuff. Um, and you know, it was difficult because you, you end up going into this, uh, environment that's unfamiliar to you. You don't speak the language. Granted, they all usually speak English. Um, but it was overall fairly, you know, difficult, but luckily I had the support of all the coaches and new friends that I had made, that welcomed me despite my differences and inability to necessarily speak the language. And through that, it, it really helped me gain some confidence and feel welcomed ultimately, which was very important to me. Yeah. Citizenship is so interesting. I mean, Luke's got how many, like mm -hmm. 10 passports, five passports, Luke, four passports. Yeah, okay. So he's got four passports when I was consulting. All world. Exactly. Yeah. Mr. Worldwide, as he wanted to call himself for a little bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, I was consulting with the Philippines and also um, a, a Russian backstroker, Arkady, I can never pronounce his name, uh, Vietchin. And uh, I was telling the Philippines, oh, you know, he's he's not looking to represent Russia anymore. He was looking to represent the U.S. And they're like, oh, well, he can represent the Philippines. And I think he, they kind of said it jokingly, but I was like, really? Like, how does that even work? And they're like, oh, yeah, ask him. And he's like, no, I want him you know, want to work with them, uh, be American. You know, I've been here training in Florida and I was like, is, is this how it really works or how does every country just get to set their kind of own standards and should there be more standardization to this? Yeah. Um, you know, some countries have their, they have their own deals, their own, um, organization for, you know, how you obtain citizenship. You know, the U S is known for having birthright citizenship. Um, and in the Netherlands, it's, it's, it's different. It's not through birthright, you know? Um, and one of my friends that I had met on that 2017, uh, my first junior trip, um, one of my best friends now, I train with him to this day, uh, Kenzo, uh, he's from Suriname. Mm -hmm. He was born there in Paramaribo. Uh, however, his, um, his parents are both Dutch, so he is not able to have Suriname citizenship because they don't have, um, birthright, uh, citizenship there. So it's, you know, it's, each country has their own deal and it can really affect how, uh, how your career can turn out. Yeah. I, I joked about going to Holland and realizing everybody's six foot seven, but I remember when I went to England cause my dad is English and I was like, Oh, that's why I'm like this. Oh, like there was something about the culture of where my parents and ancestors came from that made me discover a bit more about myself. And I felt a little bit more at home and I understood a bit more of, why I maybe thought like this growing up in the islands. Did you, when you moved from Texas to go and train with Mark, right? In uh, a year ago, mm -hmm. yeah. um, did, yeah. you, did, did that help knowing like, yeah, that's why I like being early. That's why it's a disaster or it's okay. You know, it's like ones and zeros. That's why I'm like this. And it helped you feel more comfortable, even more in yourself mm -hmm. and helped your training. Yeah. Um, you know, 
at that point or when I moved last year, uh, I had already known a bunch of the people, a bunch of the coaches, but in most of the community. So it didn't feel like a, a super intense move or nerve wracking move by any means. Um, what would you say about everyone being tall in the culture? You know, uh, I can walk around here and I'll see some guys walk around that are seven two, and I'm like, okay, I'm not the outlier here anymore. You know, I think it's, the, I'm pretty sure for, for men, it's the tallest country in the world. So by no means am I, you know, insane, insanely tall by being six, seven anymore. But, um, I feel like I fit in, you know, it's a diverse, diverse city in Amsterdam where I live. So I see people from all over the world all the time, a lot of tourists. So, um, I mean, Austin was also very diverse. So, I mean, then again, it, it doesn't feel too, too different to what I, what I was used to in terms of meeting new people and the culture and everything. Of course we eat different things and there's different accents, but for the most part, you know, it's a bunch of the world, you know, places of the world merging together to create one city. Oh yeah. For yeah. such a tall country, what's up with the tiny beers? What do you call yeah. these things? Fly oh G's? my gosh. Fly, can you say it for me? Fly G? I That's honestly, I don't, I don't know. Like, yeah. They're like eight ounces. I, I was, um, so I used to, yeah, I used yeah. to go, um, to, uh, I worked for a company that had an office in the Netherlands. And so whenever mm-hmm. I was traveling there to their office, they, we would go and drink beers, but it was like, they were like six or eight ounces. So like you would just be crushing yeah. it. And then I'd be sitting here Super like, small, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. yeah, but they, they just, they just, it's almost like a Brazilian steakhouse where, um, at least the places that <laughs> yeah, I went, yeah. where they like, you know, you just turn, turn it to green and, you know, as long as it's green, they're going to keep bringing the meat out. <laughs> like it was like that, yeah, 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 exactly. like, sl- you know, slam six, eight ounces and shut it down and they're going to bring another one and fill it right back up. I was like, look at this tiny thing. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I realized is the, um, I mean, the USA is known for having huge portions of everything, bigger drinks, bigger food, bigger fast food meals, et cetera. It's really true. And um, came over here and I'm like, oh, I want to get a burger. It's like, I don't get the the massive, say, McDonald's burger that you normally get here. Everything is smaller. You know, everything is, granted, it may be a bit more healthy. They're a little bit more strict with uh, all the the bio, the biodiversity and everything, all the all the, what is it called? Nutrients and stuff. It's all very important to balance everything, no hormones. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, everything's bigger in Texas. That's what they say, right? <laughs> yeah, there's so, no Bucky's uh, it's in a change. Uh, the Netherlands, huh? <laughs> oh, I think if someone had a, if someone from the Netherlands saw Bucky's, they'd probably have a heart attack. Yeah, <laughs> what a burger. Bucky's really going for it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, I had a question. My daughter is 11 years old and she plays soccer and all the girls on her soccer team are about her height. They're like five foot, four foot eight. But there's this one girl who's, I don't know, five foot five. She's huge. And she's just so uncoordinated on the pitch. And she reminds me of a puppy who hasn't figured out how to deal with their height yet when it comes to like running. Mm-hmm. When did you, did, was that ever an issue with your height and, and sport? And if so, when did you figure out how to take advantage of your height to be able to be such a great swimmer in, 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 in swimming? Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult because, um, my brother and my sister are also pretty tall. So, um, they also face some of the same issues with coordination. Um, yeah, I struggled with it a lot. And, uh, you know, in, in sports that I played before, like basketball or soccer or baseball, um, <clears throat> the coordination was a bit, bit more difficult to, to get down, you know, in swimming I did. I think if you consider breaststroke, it's mainly two movements, it's your arms and your legs. There's not a lot of rotating or anything. I can get in the way and that's always been a, a challenge for me and the water is always pretty forgiving if you consider if you compare it to doing a lot of dry land exercises that involve core and stability and balancing because then you're working with gravity you know it's minimizing the water um but i guess you know being tall uh you're kind of expected or most most of the time expected to be a sprinter and put a lot of muscle on you and you end up swimming the fifth year of the hundred um, and in my case, I don't think you see too many, you know, six, seven, six, six, uh, 200 breaststrokers. So um, I'm kind of an outlier here, yeah. um, which is, which is cool. You know, it's cool to be different. Um, but you know, and I always have in the back of my mind, you know, what would it be to just, you know, put on 20 pounds of muscle and just start from the 50 and the hundred, you know, see where that can go. <laughs> cool thought. Well, maybe you could, 
<laughs> yeah, we were we just had Mona McSherry yeah. on, and we were joking with her about like what Daniel Whiffen could go in a in a hundred or two in a breaststroke, and all I could think was, oh, yeah. man, he's like tall guy, skinny guy. Uh, what like what worse build to do breaststroke? <laughs> all I could think, it just seemed yeah, like honestly. tall and thin. Maybe not. You're more muscular than he is. I would imagine. I don't know like all your stats between the two, but just it, like it yeah, seems like yeah. you know you're much more much much stronger. But I think. Um, like generally speaking you've got a lot more to figure out coordination wise i mean that's always what they talk about absolutely like basketball players and like the skill and, mm -hmm. and everything so um but i, I kind of wonder back to the back to the family piece like what what events did your mm -hmm. parents swim it was uh and what how, how yeah. was kind of the, their development through the sport of swimming uh so my father also swam for the netherlands he was a sprint breaststroker, mainly 50 and 100. Um, and my mom was a freestyler, 50, 100, 200. Um, I'd say her best, from what she told me, you know, was the 100 freestyle. So somewhere in the middle. And then the 200, 50 was so and so. Um, but, you know, growing up in a swimming household, you know, um, there was a lot of focus on the sport and hearing, uh, you know, how well my dad did and all his accomplishments, as well as my mom at the, the USA junior team. Um, I was just, you know, blown away. I was like, Oh, I want to do this. You know, I want to, I want to reach their level. And I was inspired in a way. Um, and I think through, I guess my age group career, I also out of high school, my two best strokes were breaststroke and freestyle. So, uh, it must be in the genes. Yeah. I, I wish, I wish my kids heard you. My kids are not inspired by my swimming achievements and to go, <laughs> so I'm trying to get them, but it's in the genes. Like, honestly, my, uh, you, both these guys have seen my kids swim. It's ridiculous how genes play a role in, in it. There's something about it, like you just get it. Like a coach can tell you and you just understand and you can execute immediately what the coach tells you to do. It's really interesting, right? Yeah, yeah. Some people have um, relatively better feel for the water than others. And that's, you know, it could be something with the brain. So it could be uh, a genetic component. Um, it's very interesting. It differs from person to person. Um uh, growing up, I, my brother at a younger age, you know, there was a point I think where I was maybe 12, 13 and he was, he's two years younger than me and he yeah. was beating my ass <laughs> you know, when we were doing breaststroke and but literally everything I would, I would see him just beat my times. I'm like, well, this is, you know, this is not too fun. You know, when you're the older brother, I'm, I was a lot bigger than him just because I'm kind of an outlier here, but, um, you know, genes play a role. And, um, I get from a young age, he had a lot better coordination than, than I did. And, uh, you know, yeah, it definitely plays a role. Yeah, uh, it's. I want to get to jeans and swimming again and your height. So when I swam yeah. in the 90s, uh, Marcel Vuda came and trained with us for for one oh, yeah. one season. And I remember racing at 25 against him, right? 25 short course meters. I swam freestyle. He swam breaststroke. Dude took how tall yeah. was Marcel? Like six, seven or something. Dude took four yeah. mm -hmm. strokes, maybe three or four. I never forget. And I was doing freestyle, and he almost beat me. Um, not surprised. <laughs> listen he was a medalist in 400 i am okay there we go um yeah. so let's i want to go to i want to we want to hit paris but i want to start with the final of the 200 breaststroke and i was looking at your final and from what i can see you took 12 strokes the first 50 12 is that it, how, how do you do 12 strokes your first 50 still were like second or third at the wall how do you talk to me about your stroke length and your tempo and your power and your, uh, and your easy speed for a six foot seven breaststroker uh, you know, um, being a really tall, skinny kid, I don't know if you've seen pictures of me when I was like 12, 13, 14, I look like Slender Man, if you know who that is, that, that monster character. So they're just super tall, super skinny, um, uncoordinated, uncoordinated, um, and not very strong. Yeah. So even as a, at a young age, you know, uh, I was so much taller than everyone and I had trouble moving my body through the water because I didn't necessarily have that strength. Yeah. Um, so I would overall just move slower through the water and kind of just always focus on stroke count. If someone over there has taken, you know, seven strokes, short course yards, I'll go and take three or four and yeah, I'll be moving at a slower pace, but it's just what my body can do at that point. And, uh, by no means do I look like, uh, Nicola Martinengi, Arno or Ken Hayang, the super built massive dudes. Um, and I, I'm still trying to grow into that and get a little bit more muscle so I can increase my stroke temp, uh, stroke rate. But, you know, yeah, you said I took 12 strokes. Yeah. That's just something I kind of practice every day. It's a feel thing, you know. I don't necessarily, 
even though my coach might want me to sometimes count my strokes, it's always just a feel thing. I don't necessarily have to think about it anymore. It's once you reach that rhythm, it kind of just yeah. flows and you go through it easy speed. Um, I have a relatively good start. So uh, yeah. that also can help for the <laughs> doing those 12 strokes. I can just hide underwater, which is a lot of, a lot of fun short course, especially. Hey, everybody. Quick pause to say thank you for watching and listening to Social Kick. If you like this episode, give it a like. And if you like what we're all about, consider giving us a follow or subscribe on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, at Social Kick Swim. You know what to do. Thanks so much for hanging out with us. And we'll keep telling all the stories about swimming. Cheers. You were like second to the 15 in, in starting the 200, you know, and even your turns and your pullouts are great. And I think your last 50, you did what, 18 strokes or so in your last 50 when you picked up your tempo. What was that? Yeah. You know, one, of the, one of the questions that an audience member had was, what was it that you changed and when did you make that change in your tempo and your stroke rate or, or, or even your, your power or your timing in the 200? Uh, for one thing, it's, you know, once you turn off that third 50 wall, you're absolutely gassed. Maybe, maybe not other guys, like maybe Leon something different, but I felt absolutely gassed. And um, it means you come up a little bit earlier. You know, you're out of breath. You don't go as far underwater. Yeah. Um, and one thing that I learned from um, the past, some past years of breaststroke from 2021, 2022, 2023, 2023, I would always usually take it out pretty fast and then get to the end and kind of just blow up at the end. The piano man would come visit me. Uh, so... Uh, I, I worked on technique a lot this past year and a bit more of race strategy. And after Doha, where uh, Ji Hao Dong hawked me the last last 20 meters uh, at Worlds, you know, I thought, okay, I need to ra uh, do a smarter race. And I remember thinking during that race, okay, I'm ahead. The adrenaline's going. Let's just go for it. Put it all in. And I ended up just totally falling apart at the end. So in Paris, I thought last 20 or last 50 build the first 25 and then once you reach about 30 meters build increase the tempo and just get to the wall the the great sergio lopez fellow 200 breaststroke medalist um says the key to 200 breaststroke is those who don't slow down the person who doesn't slow down so, so that's, who doesn't slow down as much as everybody else will win it and you know and yeah. it looks as though you're catching up but actually you're just not slowing down as fast as everybody else what are you doing to not to, to deal with that pain and and not decelerate as much as everybody's decelerating and maintain your position because you did that you were third 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 and you finished third strong what did you do mentally physically to maintain your you know your, your speed almost uh you know um a lot of a lot of it had to do with the type of training uh i was doing um compared to to eddie he's very old-fashioned you know that was my last year at texas very much just long aerobic swimming um grinding in a way which is good. It works. A lot of people do amazing off of that. Take Carson, for example, absolute beast. One of my good friends. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, coming over here, um, I did more, more meters, more yardage than I had ever done before, but it's at lower intensity. We mix in a lot of more specific technique work. We use a camera every day, work on starts or getting a, a side profile view. So you can see exactly how your legs are moving. If they're moving at the right time, how's your pull impacting, your drag, all the, all the little elements. Um, and I really, really tried my best to focus on technique this year and every stroke of breaststroke I did, whether it be in a drill or sprinting or just easy swimming to make it as I would do it in a race. Um, and that was very critical to that last 50, um, or la last hundred, last 75, uh, of just maintaining, uh, yeah. the stroke, even when you're, you're feeling some pain. All right, I have two two things here. First, you mentioned Carson. We have a little thing going. Carson Foster, David Johnson, thousand yard free. Who do you have? Who do you have? Um, I'm not gonna count out Carson because oh. if it's <laughs> if it was long course, I don't know. Maybe it's a bit easier. Don't have you can't hide underwater. Can't use those turns as well. He's he's got good turns. Um, short course, I don't know. I'm not gonna count him out. <laughs> I don't I don't want to count uh, you know count out my boy Dave either, but um. <laughs> I think it would be a good race. It'd be a close race, especially if they both uh, are, you know, out for blood. There we go. All right. We still want to see it. Let's make it happen. All right. Um, yeah. Back to breaststroke though. And you mentioned uh, turns there and you have great underwaters, great pullouts. Are there any tips that you have for people that are trying to improve their, their pullouts and get better at them? Uh, you know, um, the biggest thing that I, I've been working on my pullouts this morning. Uh, I figured out, we did a bit of analysis 
um, the other day. Um, one of our scientific directors helped me pulled up, you know, my different speeds throughout the pullout phases compared to other swimmers that I train with and off the wall, I have a really great streamline. And I think that is probably one of the most important things is having a really good body body position and minimizing drag at all points throughout your underwater phase. Um, but we found out that, you know, I go a bit farther underwater than most people because I take a longer pause in between the dolphin kick and the pull down phase. Um, but what we found out today or yesterday was that I actually lose a lot of speed there because I wait. And granted, if I shorten up that time, I may come up a little bit sooner, a meter or two sooner, but I'll have a lot more speed going into those first few strokes, which, which can uh, create a big difference. So I would say uh, streamline, huge, huge part of it. And when you're going into that first stroke, making sure that your hands are totally in streamline before you initiate that kick, because that, those are the things that absolutely kill me. So uh, I, I got to work on those. And I think those are very important to, uh, to focus on. And be six foot seven. Sorry. <laughs> hey, I mean, you got you some of the other Japanese swimmers in the tuna breaststroke, not super tall, but absolute monsters. So, you know, maybe, maybe height isn't everything in these cases. Yeah. I don't know. A bit, a bit ironic that the, uh, the tall guy ends up going two PBs in the, the shallow pool at the Olympics. But, um, yeah, speaking of, uh, going best times at the Olympics is, uh, I think what everybody wants uh you know you train like crazy to do that uh and 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 you show up in the heats and go pb in the 100 breaststroke and i'm sure uh you're thinking hell yeah like we're off to a great start um from there to get to the 200 breaststroke final however uh was i'm sure not exactly the arc that you imagined for your meet to go of course, of course with. Not. <laughs> yeah um as so we could say it going slower each round in the in the in the 100 breaststroke um yeah you know finishing eighth in a heat where your prelim time would have meddled uh, all the way Over, to come yeah. back and then do it yeah. do it the right way through the 200 so i want to know like what was that like for you to experience the the whole bit of a up and down that your Olympics went through ultimately culminating and, you know, the ultimate prize of, of getting a medal. Yeah. You know, um, I talked with Mark throughout the entire year about um, my potential and what I think I can do and what I think I can accomplish this, this year. Uh, 58 was one of those big things. And I got very close in those, in that preliminary swim. You know, I touched the wall. I saw I was ahead of a lot of people. Oh, this could be it. I'm 59 0, really, really mm-hmm. close. Um, going to the semis, I think 59 2 or something, you know, 0.1 tenth and a bit slower, which was, you know, basically almost the, the same race. Um, maybe changed up some things that I shouldn't have. And then going to that final, um, I was having a, a talk with Mark before the race and just thinking, you know, for, for one, I wasn't supposed to be there if I'm looking at the rankings in the first place. So it's already a, a bonus. I didn't feel nervous. It was just an all already uh, a bonus just being there happy, you know, go and do what I you can do what I want to do. But in the back of my mind, and I mentioned this to him, we talked about it. If I want to be on that podium, it's most likely going to probably be a 58 five to get a medal. Um, and we said, you know, you gotta, you gotta change. Obviously that wasn't the case, but you got to change something. You got to, you got to push yourself to get to that next level. Um, and in my mind, I thought, okay, just going to attack a bit more of that first 50. Cause a lot of people have a bit more opening speed than I do. Um, especially in the hundred. And I, you know, I thought, okay, increase my tempo, but you know, breaststroke is one of those strokes where you can increase your tempo and then absolutely fall apart. And you, you end up even going slower with a higher frequency. So, um, you know, I took, I took a leap of faith, for example, and, uh, you know, it didn't pay off and it, it, w- it was difficult. Definitely seeing the, the you know, 59, nine being like, okay, I've done this. I d- did it in a speedo two weeks before at a training camp. You know, this is it's pretty, you know, pretty terrible, but just thinking, you know, I wasn't supposed to be there in the first place. So I can't be too hard on myself. And of course the big event for me is coming up. So don't dwell on the, the negativity and just you know, try and change your mind onto the 200. Yeah. Like you said, seeing the times 59-0 winning, I guess, what was your initial thought when you saw that that won? And then maybe after the fact, like, what was the, 
I don't know, the dialogue or the thought process amongst all the breaststrokers about just like, what's going on with these times? We all heard this pool is so shallow. It's so slow. You, you like B said, what a best time in prelims. Um, yeah. So what, what, what was everyone saying? You know, honestly, I do feel like the pool impacted it a bit in all honesty. Um, I could stand and my head would basically be at the surface. <laughs> um, and I, I did feel a bit of waves or restriction. I'm a bigger guy. So maybe, you know, girls, they have a full body suit. They're a little bit higher in the water, maybe about smaller. They didn't feel it as much. I felt like I felt it. Maybe that's a mental thing. But even when I, when I dove in before the meet started, I thought, damn, this pool is, this pool is shallow. It didn't feel right. Yeah, exactly. Diving and almost breaking my nose. Um, and, uh, you know, but seeing those times, it's, you know, I, my coach Mark had mentioned this a hundred times before he'd say, you know, at the Olympics, almost no one goes PBs, but you know, what matters is the place. It's not about the times. So you could go one Oh four and you could be third going into finals. Who cares? Yeah. You're five seconds off where you should be going, but Hey, you know, it's all about the metal. It's all about the, the place ultimately. So, um, and the end of the day, everyone else had to go through the same thing. So it's not like anyone had an advantage over the other. So it is what it is, you know? So you're, so you're, so you're coming out of the hundred breaststroke going, okay, well I gave it a shot, you know, I rolled the dice and it didn't yeah. work out, but not like, you know, super down. Cause you're playing with house money. You get a rest day, you come back, and yeah, yeah. You, yeah, yeah. you know, you, you stack up the 200 breaststrokes the right way, a little bit faster each round prelim to semis. And then you drop a 207 mm -hmm. PB in the final, uh, with Luke's aforementioned, you know, crazy uh low stroke count and just finishing it strong the way you want to it's so hard not to watch that race too and listen to uh the la 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 that the whole oh, yeah. crowd is yeah, doing yeah. for every every breath that leon is taking so um like yeah. mm -hmm. what, what was what was it like coming into that final after you've had the experience of you know your first event through through the olympics you know in uh well obviously i know that you swam in, in tokyo but i mean just like at this games um and you know and and your a event but also with all the hype too that's happening around you know just the the head to head showdown with um you know Zach Stubble D. Cook versus Leon and then you're 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 kind of there you're in the mix too but it seems like all the attention's on those two so yeah just yeah. talk through us talk us through the 200 then again you know um you know, I came in with an opportunity. I wasn't necessarily expected to make the podium by any means. So it was all just a bonus. And, you know, I was overall happy to be there. I wasn't nervous, you know, go back, you know, two years ago in Budapest, you know, I was like almost puking on the blocks. I was so nervous, just crap in my pants. Oh my God, what, you know, what's going to happen? I need to, I need to show up, but what I really appreciate. And, um, um, I'm happy that Mark throughout this past year, helped me build confidence, um, in myself and also <clears throat> in the way I see myself and view other people's pressure and the environment per se. Um, and we did a lot of racing, you know, a lot, we were at the world cups, we were at the meets in Poland, we were, um, set to Coley, we were, you know, Marin Austin all over the world, you know, and doing a lot of competitions, a lot of racing that it kind of just becomes, um, you know, you go on autopilot. You don't, you don't have to worry. You know what you're capable of. There's no, there's no real stress. It was all just happy. You know, I walked out and like, okay, here we go. You know, it's time. I know Leon's going to be good. I know Zach's going to be good. Oh, I know all the other guys could be amazing too, but ultimately I know what I can do and nothing that anyone else is going to do is going to affect me. It's just, I've done this. I think we counted up. It was like 2,200 press strokes or 200 press strokes up until that point and uh, you know from from january until then and i was like okay you know if i've been 208 15 of those times why can't i be 207 here you know and this is ultimately where you know i got to show up and do my thing so just leave it all in the pool is kind of what i thought is there um anything that arno told you so uh those who are listening arno the defending silver medalist in the event had to scratch right with an injury is there anything that he told you before that helped inspire you or, or told you before you got out there I do it for me. Not necessarily there, but like, um, you know, throughout the year, I, you know, I always look up to him because he's accomplished so much and he's always very supportive of me and, um, yeah. you know, a mentor in a, uh, in a way. Uh, and what I, I talked about trying to enjoy the moment or maybe I haven't talked about it yet, but I'll, I'll mention it now is, um, 
I wanted to, after Texas, I wasn't really in love with the sport anymore. You know, I didn't really know if I wanted to continue. Um, I had, I wasn't improving anymore. I kind of plateaued long course, short course is what it is, you know? Um, and I thought, you know, I could be done, but I'll give it one more chance. I'll move to Europe, make a huge step and see where that year goes. And if I enjoy it, it's, you know, financially feasible, you know, uh, I'm enjoying the environment. People are nice. I can feel like I can envision a life here. Then I'll keep going. Um, and you know, before, I know he also had some difficult times with mental health, especially after the games. And he had, he pulled out from Budapest, I think the 200 and, um, you know, he had an injury as well. He's faced a lot of adversity. Um, but throughout we raced next to each other so many times in training, of course, and as well as in races, uh, uh like competitions. And we made, to sh- uh, made sure to say every time before we race, we, you know, dap each other up and say, Hey, enjoy, you know, Cause you don't know how long you can do what you love. So you might as well make the most of it and just appreciate uh, everything you got in that moment. You mentioned Mark instilling confidence in you over these last, uh, last year, yeah. I guess, what are some specifics that he, he did to build that confidence? And was that something he saw that you needed or is that something you went to him with or how, how did that, you know, improve? Cause like you said, after Texas, you were, you know, not sure, if you're going to continue. Yeah. You know, it's, um, it wasn't something that I went to him for, or he necessarily went to me for, or to, to try and create, it kind of just happened naturally. Um, and that was what I I mentioned earlier about every stroke you take in training and in practice, it's got to be exactly how you want to do it in the race. He, as he, as I said, a million times, if you practice this technique every single day, every time you race, it's going to be on your backbone. You're not going to have to think anymore. And at first I was a little nervous because I was still coming out of that, um, my, you know, that Texas mindset where I was, I don't know if I want to keep doing this. You know, I, every time I go, I go up to, a you know, up to the blocks, am I going to, you know, crap the bed and go two fourteen, or am I going to go two Oh eight? It was a crap shoot. I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, but throughout the year, um, realizing myself after a race, Oh, you know, that felt pretty good. I managed to keep my head down and my hips up you know, the last 15 meters, I didn't completely fall apart. And, you know, Mark would say, Hey, it's because you're doing it in in training. You know, you're doing these drills correctly. You're keeping your hips up, head down, good streamline, everything. Uh, and then again, it's the race experience. You know, if you do something a hundred times, you'll know how to do it the hundred and first time. So that was a bit of the confidence in myself, um, just in training and in racing that experience that I gained, um, kind of helped me grow into myself this year. And, um, ultimately, you know, get me to where I am now. Speaking of where you are now, we were talking about like, Hey, let's give this a shot. Go, um, abroad, see if you love the sport again. Sounds like training's evolved uh, quite dramatically, um, to get you on the right side of that. And then also you mentioned the, you know, can, can, can I sustain it financially? What are the, yeah. can you now? <laughs> like, I mean, you got a bronze medal and I would imagine opportunities, uh, on the Netherlands team as a, a locally trained athlete now is opening up some other opportunities. What does that look like? Uh, you know, uh, in the U S um, there's definitely a bigger market and a lot more eyes on you. Of course, sport is huge over in the U S as we know, um, you can look at American football, you can look at soccer, you know, you can look at, uh, the NBA, you know, there's money everywhere just getting poured into it. So, um, you know, the stipends and stuff. I've heard what the USA guys get because I've, you know, I've trained with them, blah, blah, blah. It's not, there's not so much money, you know, money over here for sure. And the bonuses that you may hear about from like the USA team, the Operation Gold, all that stuff. It's nothing compared to that. Um, no. So a lot of it for, is the opportunity. those earrings then? <laughs> these earrings, you know, I've had these earrings since uh, 2019. It's the same ones. So I, <laughs> I love them. They're my favorite, you know? Um, But, um, yeah, I, it's financially feasible. So, you know, we get a stipend every month and it's basically the prize money that can help, um, you know, keep me stable. You know, if you go even every month, then that extra prize money really helps and, uh, still trying to get in a a suit sponsor. So working on that, seeing what we can do. Um, and that will definitely help me out as well. So. 
For the Olympic but, but, bronze medalist, come on, man, let's get a suit sponsor. Exactly. Yeah, no kidding. Plus you're in the land of all the all the money <laughs> yeah. meets. I mean, that was one thing in my career that I went to Europe yeah. and, and yeah. was able to like you know make some cash on a weekend and make you know two k, three k here yeah. and there. I don't know what the money's like now, but the opportunities yeah. were uh, plentiful yeah. in Europe. Yeah, a lot of opportunities here. That's for sure. Yeah. I mean, you met the king and queen. Come on. I mean, the, the, the fanfare you had when you came back <laughs> yeah. home, it was pretty cool. What, what was one of the coolest things that you had in your welcome back and they're honoring you? And what was one of the weirdest moments or you had when you came back to Holland? Uh, you know, yeah, you're meeting the king and the queen is, you know, is amazing. Um, and, you know, having these people honor you is pretty awesome. But I, to me, the best thing was, you know, if I'm, if I'd already started training again or I'm walking, I'm walking by the pool and some little kid comes up to me and says, Hey, like, can I have your kind of picture with you? I find that the the best and like the most important to me. Yeah. Meeting, you know, meeting these amazing people with huge backgrounds is, is pretty cool. But seeing a kid who, where I was once in their shoes, looking up to these Olympians and like, you know, world championship medalists, et cetera, thinking, Oh my God, you know, I just met them. It's, it's amazing. That's really important to me and making sure that I, give back to them, say in the picture, or if they want a signature, whatever it may be, giving them that experience and that, um, you know, yeah. positive emotion is very important to me. It's not, not so much that, you know, the extracurriculars, they're awesome. Don't get me wrong. I'm very grateful to be able to go on them, but it's the smaller things with, um, you know, making other people's days or, cause I know, you know, how it was at one point for me, you know, looking up to yeah, 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 Michael Phelps, Ryan Lochte, all the, you know, Tom Shields, all those big guys. So, yeah. I um I want to get back to suit sponsor. I I I um in the heralded New York Post here, yeah, um K Kaminga had a headline of this controversial suit he wore. They all thought they <laughs> naked on it, and it's very funny, right? Yeah. <laughs> so let's get back to suits. What's the ideal suit for you for um for breaststroke? It, 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 do you like a particular design of suit for for breaststroke that gives you more flexibility, especially for somebody with such freaking big legs and you know maybe a wide kick? What's your ideal suit? The, you know, um, the biggest thing for me is since being tall, um, you know, it's a huge factor is the suit length. You know, um, I've had suits in the past that come midway down my thigh and end up cutting circulation off in the middle of my leg. I'm like, okay, this isn't going to work, you know, and finding that balance between, you know, the, the right waist, um, you know, tightness and length compared to, you know, the suit length and the, the inseam is very important to finding that balance. Um, you know, I grew up um, racing an arena at a club team. Mm -hmm. Then I went to Texas and everyone there was Mizuno. You know, that was fun. I enjoyed it. Uh, wore the multi-racer there. That was in the SL for long course 200 breaststrokes. Just something with some, you know, a little bit more uh, range of motion in the hips yeah. and the legs. Yeah. Um, and then I think that the Primo, I wear that now. I've worn that the entire year since December. And that's been, you know, a perfect suit. It's... Um, it's flexible. It has the good length. It's, it feels, feels almost rubbery, even though it's not, cause that's illegal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah. you know, I feel like I have uh, good support in the water and, um, the, the biggest thing is just having, um, something that fits my body, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can't say, can't say rubber with suits almost feels like can't say bomb on an airplane. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, <laughs> so ideally, um, would you have a, a customized suit? Cause I, um, it, it harkens me back to like, uh, I remember well, I swam in the full body suit era um, and then those were banned and then I swam several years in jammers too. But like, uh, I remember wearing the Speedo laser. I wore a small tall and I'm 6'4 and it mm -hmm. made no sense to me that <laughs> there was anyone who wore a medium or a large and so yeah. I mean, yeah. you're, you would be like one of the only ones, but you would still be wearing like, you know, you would want it to be really slim, not wider. So um, yeah, yeah. I, just, I think like suiting, uh, suit sizing is, it has always been kind of strange, um, but it seems like, you know, an ideal sponsor for you would have like a custom cut so that you could like, you know, specify the, yeah. the length and, you know, just have it fit for you. Yeah. You know, uh, I don't know if I'm at that level yet, but uh, you know, I can, uh, I can hope. And, um, fortunately for me, you know, there's enough brands out there with suits that actually fit and I can make it work. It's not ridiculously uncomfortable or anything. So I think I'm in a good spot right now. If I can get to that, that day where I can say, this is what I want. This is the color way I want all that thing. That'd be pretty amazing, but you know, I'll, I'll keep striving. Or you could just stick to showing off the quads, you know? 
<laughs> yeah, you know, halfway up the leg. <laughs> Show the quads. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we all know breaststrokers are weird. And one weird thing I feel like breaststrokers do is you put on your suit and you're doing some weird movements to make sure you still have the hip mobility and it's like yeah. setting in. So what's your what's your move after you put on your suit? Yeah, well, uh, I usually I do the same. Some people like squat down and then spread the legs. And that, I feel like that's kind of risky because, you know, if it's not in right, it just burst open. <laughs> I've had that. I've had that happen before. Um, and there's people, there were some pictures of me yeah, at the Olympics and also like my hands by, by my groin, you know, making sure the suit fits, but it's just making sure it's up and up one leg and up on the other to sit balanced in both ways, bit OCD, you know, making sure it's level. That's, that's my go-to just making sure it's pulled up high enough. You know, there's no, uh, extra space. High and tight. Yeah. Hopefully in those, yeah, in, in high those moments, NBC's not, NBC's not zooming in on uh, the private time happening there. <laughs> Yeah, what was it? Yeah, the, that's a, Ricky Barron's yeah. uh, uh, blew out the backside of his suit right on a relay. So yeah, yeah. that was yeah. bad enough. We don't yeah. need a growing blowout. Yeah, yeah that would be <laughs> and, you know, especially on prime too. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. it grows a sport, man. Come on. <laughs> well, it's like the backstroke videos. They like zoom in. On, you've seen the cameras that are on the backstroke blocks now. Oh, yeah, they like yeah, yeah, zoom yeah. in, and it's like right in the person's like abdomen. I yeah. mean, yeah. or even in their crotch. I feel like oh. Yeah. yeah, it could be nightmare fuel, you know. It, it could be one bad moment, suit rips, and you dive back. Say, are you going to stop? No, I'm going to keep going. So, yep. meme forever. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Casper, I want to, I want to find out to where we are now. So, your your teammate in Texas, David Johnson, he took a year off, went to train with Mark, saw him really, really well, made the Olympics, and now has gone back to train with Bob in Texas, and is expecting Leon. Are you going back to Texas, of course, to swim with Bob and train with your 200 breaststroker? I know I'm joking, but what's your plan now? Where you're at? Where are you going for Worlds? Are you doing World Cups? What's your plan for the next six months? Are you just chilling? Yeah. So I do have eligibility. <laughs> that is yeah. something that's still kind of funny. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but, you know, at, at the moment, um, Mark, I don't know if you guys have known or there, there's been in the Dutch news, but Mark is no longer my coach. Um, so I have a new coach, interim coach case. Um, he's great, you know, really helping me through all these changes and everything. Um, but yeah, on, um, on Monday I fly to Shanghai for the world cup series. Um, that should be super exciting. I'm looking forward to it. That'll be my opportunity to qualify for short course worlds. Um, that'll last for three weeks. And then hopefully if everything goes to plan. The Dutch are only taking eight people total. Could be seven guys, one girl. Could be four or four. You know, it's it's just whoever you know, whoever shows up and whoever swims the fastest times. Um, so I just have to uh, you know lock in and uh, you know enjoy the ride per se. That's how the next few months up until December are going to look. Yeah. What are you hearing about the Shanghai World Cup? I think I there was a headline like uh, the the event sold out in seconds and now tickets are selling for like 10 times, like the, the list price. Um, any other info you have heard or any other excitement and into that meet? Yeah, that's news to me. I mean, if it's packed, that'd be pretty amazing, but I'm sure after, you know, the success that some of the Chinese swimmers have had in Paris in the past few years, a lot of people are going to want to see them race. So, you know, having one big event at home is, is pretty big. So, you know, if it's packed, awesome, you know, big crowd should be fun. A lot of energy. Are, are you tempted to potentially win another championship of Texas in March? You know, it's always, uh, you know, it's always in the back of my mind. Um, I love Austin. You know, the city is amazing. I don't know if you guys have been there a few times, but yeah. food is great. Sun, you know, it's yeah, almost yeah. always sunny, you know, great city, a lot of nature around. You can base, you have everything you need. And on top of that, I have a lot of those, a lot of my really be you know, best friends, you know, living there and, of course, I miss them. I don't get to see them that much anymore. So, you know, and also, you know, in the back of my mind thinking, hey, have I really accomplished everything I wanted to in short course yards? Maybe not. So, you know, I'm not saying no. I'm not saying yes. I'm just keeping all my doors open at this moment and, uh, you know, figuring out what would be best for me. Yeah. Good job. Right on, man. All right. Well, we just got a few rapid fire and we'll let you go. All right. All right. <laughs> What's the hardest race in swimming? Or I am. Olympic gold or world record? Olympic gold. Can't be taken away. What are you listening to, watching, or reading right now? Uh, listen to music. Um, I'm listening to, I, I like a lot of uh, metal music. It's a bit different, you know. 
kind of puts people off sometimes when I, when I say that, but you know, yeah, grunge metal. That's kind of my thing at the moment. Grunge metal. All right. Uh, this one's from an audience, uh, member, uh, Mark, Mark Norwegian or Swedish candy. Oh man. Okay. Marcus. Yeah. Uh, I haven't had Norwegian candy yet, but Swedish candy is pretty good. So it's got Norwegian candy is going to be pretty good to, uh, to top that. All right. Uh, and Jake Foster wants to know who your favorite college roommate was. <laughs> it's gotta be Jake. <laughs> you know, gotta give it to my boy, Jake. I miss him. <laughs> gotta give it, gotta give their, gotta give the people what they want. Um, exactly. All right. Exactly. Uh, how how did you know? Uh, what gave you the confidence that you could pull off the double earring? The double earring, you know. I always, you know, I was always different. You know, I'm I'm super tall, lanky. You know, like different kind of music. You know, I like earrings. I like tattoos. I was like, hey, you know, whatever fits my vibe. I was like, hey, double earring, black stud. That's my thing. That's how it is. What's the next tattoo? Oh. Uh, don't tell my parents while well, they're going to see this anyways. Uh, <laughs> but I think, <laughs> I think I'm going to get a, um, a scythe, uh, like a Grim Reaper scythe on my forearm. Um, and, uh, in the blade will be kind of the Grim Reaper peering through just its skull. So kind of there's an artist here in the Netherlands that uh, he does really, really good work, really realistic work. And I, I think it's going to look pretty good. Nice. What do you say if your parents are uh, all concerned that you're going to go full back piece? Oh, full back. I don't know if that's me. Um, maybe, maybe at one point, but I'm just, I'm just going for small little things that, you know, have some meaning or I think are pretty, pretty cool or maybe represent who I am. All right. Got to have sponsors on the back. Sponsors. Exactly. You know, get a little protein. Or a Breaststroke, right? That's what back. they'll be seeing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Hannah tattoos. All right. Uh, and Alas, uh, how, how often are you doing social kick there in training right now? Social kick, um, you know, usually, at, you know, during, uh, during training, there's at least a hundred or 200 with fins at the end, just to, just to relax. And you know what, if I'm, if I'm feeling nice and social, I'll, I'll, you know, slow down and talk to someone next to me. If I'm like, I want to get out of here, take a nap or listen to some music, some metal. And I'm like, all right, I'll see you guys later. You could say it's a uh, 50, 50, 50, 50 per day. Yeah, fair enough. How do you say social kick in Dutch? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, so she all banged so I don't know. There's not really <laughs> no, it's uh, yeah. Risk yeah, risk bane so something like that. Like easy kick, rest kick. Yeah, I don't know. There isn't really a it's not really a term off to look it up, see what see what we can find. Oh yeah. Oh, well, all right. You got to be our local ambassador, our local correspondent and uh in the <laughs> Absolutely. So, hey, anything you guys need. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah sounds good for man. sure for sure well, well hey we look forward to watching you in the world cups and um i i could say mm -hmm. like yeah, I, I had the pleasure of uh getting to ask you a couple questions at a world cup a, a couple years ago um live yep i remember i remember fun to um just fun to see you you make that progress you know because uh like you mentioned you know you had kind of plateaued in, in long course and um you had had like a really solid career and most of that i i watched um at texas but then to see you make the like that that career kind of defining moment, you took a courageous leap and that leap paid off. And you sound to me to be like in a really, uh, really great place with uh, yeah. what you're doing now. And that's a hard thing to do. So um, I commend you for it. And uh, I just uh, we're rooting for you. That's awesome, man. Thanks for sharing this time with us. Yeah. Thank you very much. You know, it means a lot to hear that. Um, I really appreciate it. And, uh, you know. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you guys for having me. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, and looking forward to seeing you guys some other time. Thanks. Awesome. Well, you're welcome back anytime. And uh, thanks. Uh, that's it for this episode of Social Kick. We'll see you next time. Everybody, thanks for hanging out with us. If you're enjoying Social Kick, tell your friends about it. And be sure to tell us what you liked by leaving a comment. And subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Instagram. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Social Kick. And you can find all of our content on our website at thesocialkick.com.